On, but underneath, a nice haircut. Now, why is this? Something new. Just, why did you lose the hair? It's something different. It's no particular reason. I've been living in New York City for a couple of years. I cut my hair and said, move on a little bit. I think you become more familiar with artists who are the same guy that gets off the bus that got on 10 years ago. It's it, People aren't that way. All of you listening to this aren't that way. You don't look the same way five years from now that you did ago. You moved from Los Angeles to New York. Why did you do that? Los Angeles is kind of... Um, it's, it's the rock and roll center of the world, so why move? <laughs> it has switched around. Los Angeles is all about, it's, you know, it's television and movies and such. You move to New York, it's a lot more sarcastic, it's a lot more cynical, it's a lot more suspicious and dubious. And, a lot uh, more dangerous. I am inspired. You have a conglomeration of tribes there, and, you, and there's the character in uh, the $1,700 suit who got out of the limousine. He's sitting at the same table as the person in the Dr. Martens with the leather jacket, the person in the jacket and the Martins. Martin's is the millionaire. <laughs> so, the, the guy who got out of the limo is a poet. It's like, you can't tell. We know Nobody looks like what we do for a living anymore. And it's a conglomeration of people. Um, used to be that uh, folks would say, well, there's just one kind of person who listens to this kind of music and one kind of person who listens to that kind of music. Well, the Global Village is here. And what I see out from my window down on the Lower East Side is a white guy with dreadlocks on a Harley Davidson with a Japanese girlfriend. She's the vegetarian. He He's the Buddhist. Tell me what they listen to. Okay, let's uh, let's talk about what you've been doing for the past couple of years, apart from making the album. Or has that taken up your entire life? I tried to do that as long a period as possible. Have you ever been on a sailboat, Claire? No, never. Well, the first thing you have to throw away is your schedule. I call it sailboat schedule. <laughs> you know how sailors look after they've been out to sea for a while and you screw up your face real dead? That comes from standing on the front of a boat and going, we're almost there. <laughs> and two days later, we're almost there. And you can't have a schedule. Back at maybe the turn of the century, people took a thing... Um, um, I got it out of magazines. People would go on adventures or trips or abroad, whatever, and send back installments every month, and they publish it in a magazine. And at the end of the year, uh, you had a book. Here, you have an album. Also, most times than not, when uh, an artist these days goes in to uh, record beyond their second album, because your first two albums is what you've been playing in bars for yeah. a couple of years, uh, you go into the studio and you try to uh, create history and art all in within a given 30-minute period, you know, and everything conspires against you. The clock on the clubhouse wall is ticking away for uh, $5,000 a day, what have you, and you sit there and go, okay, I'm going to write the lyric in the studio, you know. Um, and you go, oh, geez, I'm running out of space. What do I got? The moon. Oh, I got it. It's the moon. And you put down moon and you go, geez, but when is the moon happening? The moon in, in April. Claire, help me. Uh, okay. Yeah. The moon <laughs> in February. Guys, bitch. June. Yes. <laughs> and you commit it to paper and, it, you know, and, and on and on. Um, if you write something over a longer period of time, well, then your reflection on it is going to be different. If I ask, there's a song called Experience. Claire, if I ask you what experience means to you on a Friday night, chances are you're going to give me a different translation than if I ask you Monday morning. Right there, we're going to have to kill off a weekend. So <laughs> multiply that times 14 songs and what have you. You get a more three-dimensional reading, at least, of who's doing the song. So with the mechanics, would you write something, demo it, take it away, listen to it, play about with For it? For weeks. For yeah. Weeks. A decidedly high tech way. I take my stereo and I bungee cord it to the back of my bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> and I find that when you have that kind of stimulus come in as you're going through the various neighborhoods, and well, hey, some of them are really stimulating. Woo! <laughs> 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 High velocity, huh? You see me, contra me, palo. This man is mad. Híjole. You see, all of that is part of, that gets your energy going. That energizes you. And uh, over a period of weeks, usually, to begin a verse, to add another verse and such, sailboat schedule. And that way, when you go into the studio, it's part of you. So how did your producer, Niall Rogers, fit in with all this? Was he happy with the way you wanted to work? Niall was delighted. We've been threatening to work together for a really long really? time. Oh, yeah. And spiritually, we go back way far. I remember when, with the great Van Halen and going up to the door of Studio 54, and they wouldn't let me in. And, really? Uh, oh, yeah. It's, it's the wrong outfit, you know, whatever. And uh, oh, I was infuriated. Someday I'm going <laughs> to own this place. And Niall Rogers, same thing. Went to knock out the door. They wouldn't let 
Letterman, and he went back and, and he was marching around in his drawers in his apartment playing his guitar, going ah off, ah off. And then it was his partner Bernard said, "Hey, that's a good riff, but you can't say that over the radio. How about uh, freak?" Out an eight million singles later, <laughs> he really did own the place. So yeah. <laughs> spiritually there. Let's talk about some of the tracks on the album. First of all, Everybody's Got the Monkey, a track, the title I love. It's good old rock and roll. You can really sort of see it in a smoky club style What's it about? It is about time that everybody stops shifting the buck, passing the blame, and pointing the finger. The only thing, there's nothing worse than having to live with a good example. Okay? <laughs> so, so it's like, enough. Everybody has got the monkey, okay? It's, we fairly wallow in our sobriety these days. It's like, okay, let a little air out of the tires here. And... Uh, Everybody is down for it, you know. It is a time of self-awareness. It's not the early 80s anymore. We know that this is addictive or that this will kill you or whatever. But you narrow it down. I did to my f favorite four or six vices. and <laughs> <laughs> But everybody's got that monkey. define rock though don't we everyone wants to pigeonhole rock well but uh, nowadays we can't do that can we you really can't well you can in a lot of a lot of a lot of artists a lot of acts because um, they're coming from a one-dimensional kind of situation now. Um, by Through no fault of their own, the current generation, perhaps the one right behind in the rearview mirror here, is uh, there's no, no more college of musical knowledge, I call it. That's been torn out. There are many clubs where you can play original material, especially in the United States. Many, many clubs. But there are no clubs anymore where you play cover tunes where you play top 40 or whatever you want and not in your style note for note and you learn it that's your alphabet and then you turn that alphabet into whatever story you want disco thrash punk that's fine you're a spiritual flamenco you're on babe <laughs> you know? right. but it's all the same alphabet do whatever you decide to spell those clubs all basically evaporated in the last decade or so because everybody put in stereo systems why no magical reason is just stereo is never late a stereo, <laughs> a stereo never hits on your old lady. <laughs> a stereo never asks for a raise while you got a packed room out there. You can see it from a management point of view. But now you have people trying to learn off of records in their room at, at the house or some such. And that's like me saying, um, I'm going to learn Japanese in the privacy of my own home. It's like... <laughs> Right. <laughs> but if I tell you, yes, I'm going to do five 45-minute sets six nights a week of Japanese in front of a semi-inebriated hostile crowd of Japanese, <laughs> well, we're, we're at least we're going to be a little more sure to grasp at least the basics. Let's talk about experience. You mentioned it earlier on. Uh, probably one of my favorite tracks, very bluesy, very laid back. It is... 
um, perhaps a little, I can summarize a little bit now. Well, you know, I know at this point in my life, I can summarize a little bit. There's, there is now some scenery in the rear view mirror. It was all about the hood ornament up until not terribly long ago. And it is a reflection, uh, and it's not a folk song. It's a little bit sarcastic, you know. I think only a fool thinks experience can replace an education. There are some things that took me 10 years that I could have learned in 10 minutes. Somebody taught me. Somebody showed me the book. I could have read it off a page, you know. And uh, it takes a little bit of a tone to that. You know, how many people do you know? I say, well, I got street smarts. Well, prison's full of people with street smarts. It's, uh, you know, the experience moves kind of slow. You better watch out. You get off the bus, the same guy that got on 20 years. Ago. Oh, the funky horn section on a little bit of luck will Are, the horns be on tour with you um no that is no no that is a one-off kind of thing you don't want to take a whole crew of guys you know to do something like that uh but 
it's curious when people talk because I come from a guitar band kind of background. I come from a rock background and guys go, Dave, you know, uh, what were your influences? I go black. And they say, oh, really? And you need to say, uh, do you, uh, you mean like uh, Howlin' Lemon Wolf? You mean like uh, Muddy Waters? And I said, no. They say, oh, you mean like uh, <laughs> Junior Johnson with the, the famous Blind Lemon uh, Crossroad? I, no. It's like my influences was, you know, uh, immediately prior to discovering rock and roll. I went through junior high, high school, junior college. The schools is 95% black and Spanish speaking. Mm -hmm. And it was all uh, James Brown and Motown and Smokey and Marvin. And then that turned into Sly Stone and, and the Ohio players and on and on. Um, this is part of that old that old thing. I was young, but I was there. And it's, uh, you know, the Wilson Pickett thing. I, hormonally, I expect we have the same structure. Uh, <laughs> me and the song, darling. <laughs> Maybe you too. <laughs> well, I mean, the reggae influence comes out there. And, um, Fabulous um, track. Thank you. On the street corners of New York City, the guy who sells you the apple for a quarter, that's what he's listening to. That is considered the most uh, that the most powerful stuff. That's the most powerful medicine for the working man, you know, coming in that certain parts of the city. Dance hall reggae is very insistent. This is not Barb Marley time. That's mm -hmm. a little slow for my taste. I understand mm -hmm. the message, but my surgically implanted disco beat <laughs> doesn't hang with it. It's got a doom, doom, doom. That's a lot closer to rock. That's a lot closer to uh, what a number of bands have been playing over the years. So it's an easy leap. Also, 
just, uh, you know, lyrically. Again, everything, all of these subjects, I could take dead serious. I can take them dead serious. But why wallow in it? You know, you lose a little tequila wisdom. And if you can, if you smile a little bit, hey, at worst, we're, we're laughing to win. Hey, David. I saw them done, man, man. Them just go left you, man. Boy, you see? I don't mean thing. Run the rhythm, my shit, I need you. want chat, I don't mean thing. Make sure that I don't tell them about this in thing. range of musical styles is that what you, you actually set out to do originally it's my personal taste uh that i probably if i have to look in the rearview mirror again uh, i can see probably where it come from i didn't think of it consciously but all the early artists embraced all kinds of things you had a single thread that ran through it all but the stones were playing country and playing this and that and tropical and uh caribbean and steel drum they're renowned for being a rock band but they always had these other influences Jimi hendrix same same mm -hmm. the doors same the beatles especially and and just on and on led zeppelin particularly renowned as the heavy act of all time 90 percent of their material is acoustic and acoustic from a variety of different geographical places it's you know um If your cake is in order, if you've got your cake bomb proof, then put it by, you can bring your icing from many different places. Um, hopefully, you know, when you put some of the icing on some of this, for example, um, 
Uh, I did a, uh, a track here. It's got a little bit of a, a Texas edge to it. That's natural. I already own the jeans just like you do, honey. So from, <laughs> so from here, we can throw the record and hit country western. It's not like we had to put on a funny hat to get in. We already own the boots. Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains is a big fan of the Roth era of Van Halen. Now, reunions always being talked about, and Jerry says there should never be one. What do you think of that? Um, you know, I kind of quit at the height of the season. I think I made a pull to Michael Jordan. I kind of knew what was up, and I'm no saint, you know. I'm no preaching. I have my Keith Richards merit badge. <laughs> you know, the one that looks like it's going to break down any minute. <laughs> Been working perfectly for 30 years. <laughs> and uh, I, I sense that there's a change. People change. All right, people, lifestyles change, attitudes change, and uh, I don't think the old Van Halen could ever be replaced, you know, or, or or even picked up where left off. You can do a reunion exhibition game, you know, if it, come on, for a, for a charity, I'll play with anybody, but uh, I don't think the ideal, we can pick up where left off, it's not the same human beings on that side of the coin. You must have some fabulous memories, though. Oh, yeah. I'm very, very proud of, you know, what we did. We had, we accomplished things. I think we inspired a lot of people. And not in the ways that you might think. You know, no, the people didn't all rush to pick up an electrical guitar. But, for example, the fellow who discovered the folk singer Tracy Chapman was completely, he came up to me and said, I was the one who inspired him to get into the music business. That's the antithesis of what you would think of David Lee, perhaps. But he was inspired. He was motivated. That would mean so much to me if someone came up to me and said that. Yeah. And it's, it's great. And it's, I get this right and left and coming, you know, from the streets and, and so forth. Um, I'm proud of that. There are things that I'm proud of. And, then, and we did things that I regret. But you know what? I did them all superbly. And you enjoyed it. Are there, are <laughs> it there was any great. Are there any particular stories that, I mean, I don't really want to put you on the spot, but any particular, you know, funny stories that stand out? Well, I had, I had somebody had asked about it earlier, and it's a, it's a fairly well-known story. In fact, I, th I think it's, they mention it in Wayne's World 2 or some says the story of the brown M&Ms, which is, uh, it was in the contract writer that if there was a brown M&M found in the drawer uh, or the bowl of M&Ms, you know, the Smarties, whatever, that uh, they would forfeit the show at full price and that I was allowed to totally trash the dressing room. Well, this sounds completely like Spinal Tap, but originally what it was perceived as was we were one of the first with the huge contract writers with the giant productions and so forth. This was the early 80s. Come on. That was, yeah. it was a big time. And uh, we would constantly show up and find out that promoters or somebody had not read the contract and there were electrical problems and so forth. So I said, Right in the middle of the contract, in the electrical part, it'll say a nine voltage socket amperer plus, and then it says there shall be no brown M and M. So, if you walked in backstage and you found a brown M and M, for sure you're going to run into problems in another area. <laughs> now, we never told anybody that this was up. I just used it as an excuse to trash up the dressing room. I said it was great theater and what have you, you know. And then whatever happened at the event was blamed on my brown M and M's. Okay, <laughs> one day the stage sank through the floor because they didn't check the floor. The University at Pueblo, Colorado didn't hold up their end of the bargain. They didn't check their floor. The stage weighed too much, sank through their floor, and they blamed the whole thing on my brown M&Ms because I brown, found a brown M&M that was like an $80,000 M&M <laughs> that time. <laughs> History for all the wrong reasons. Hello, I'm David Lee Roth. Tonight, my special guest, <laughs> Dave Roth. <laughs> Are you going to write a book? Ultimately, yeah. You know, if I wasn't in music, I would, I would, uh, I would write. My form of writing would be so much as to talk to you and then transcribe it. And there you would have your book. Your Filthy Little Mouth, which I think would be a good title for your book. The album, anyway, is out March the 7th. You're back in the UK touring in May. David Lee Roth, thank you very much for coming thank to talk you. to us. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. The pleasure is mine.